Additional voices provided by Henry the Paleo Guy and Joshua Knupa. The evolution of snakes has long been one of the most contentious evolutionary transitions in vertebrate evolution. Snakes definitely originated from reptiles with limbs, but exactly which ones remains a mystery. To date, no definitive robust evidence of a four-limbed snake ancestor has been found. That seemed like the case until a small fossil of a snake-like reptile was uncovered in Brazil and described in 2015 as Tetrapodophis. Now, a new study has put forth evidence that the thing was neither snake nor lizard. What the hell was it and why did it take so long? Come with me and journey through the story of the four-legged snake, Tetrapodophis. Brand new designs are up on the edge Redbubble, werewolves, spiders, FedEx amphibians, protocrocs, and more. Go check out the Redbubble with links in the description and comment section below. Genomic evidence combined with comparisons between body parts over the years have proven that snakes are highly advanced lizards. Lizards that lost all their limbs, save for some floaty bits in some snakes, and evolved venom multiple times. There are many living snakes that retain vestiges of what were once pelvises and hind limbs. There are now a grand total of four ancient fossil snake cousins that had unequivocal hind limbs and pelvises. Hind limbs and pelvises that stuck outside the body and may have even worked. With all that in mind, it seems like there should be older snakes with four limbs in the fossil record. These one in a million transitional fossils are unfortunately one in a million. That was until the lottery was won back in 2015 with the description of what seemed to be a long-bodied lizard with four teeny tiny limbs attached to teeny tiny girdles. It was given the name Tetrapodophis amplectus with tetrapod referring to four limbs and ophis meaning snake. The problem with the specimen is that it was exported illegally and belongs to a private collection. The 7-inch, 17-centimeter long skeleton was preserved in a limestone slab. Its place of origin had been unknown when it came to be purchased and taken out of Brazil. Later studies on the specimen found it likely came from the Crato Formation in Ceará, Brazil, Brazil has more stringent laws on their fossil heritage than the looseness of places like the US. It is illegal for fossils to be taken outside the country, and it's also illegal for foreigners to do studies on Brazilian fossils unless they are joined by at least one Brazilian scientist. The lead author of the study that first described and named the four-legged snake fossil, Dr. David Martil, went against both of those rules by exporting the thing to Germany for study. Though the thing was actually put in someone's private collection and placed on loan to the German museum, Bürgermeister Müller Museum, located in Solenhofen. When Martil was asked about why he didn't have a Brazilian scientist on board for the study, as per the Brazilian codes, he stated, At the time I began working on the fossil, I was not aware of a Brazilian snake worker, although I'm now aware that there is a guy called Zalur. But what difference would it make? I mean, do you also want me to have a black person on the team for ethnicity reasons and a cripple and a woman? And maybe a homosexual too, just for a bit of all-round balance? I chose to work with Nick Longrich because I know him to be the best phylogeneticist in the business. He is an American USA citizen. For me, nationality or sexuality is not an issue. If you invite people because they're Brazilian, then people will think that every Brazilian author on a scientific paper is there because he is Brazilian and not because he is a clever scientist. The token Brazilian. Yeesh, that doesn't sound very open-minded. Martil later stated in 2020 that his words were poorly worded. Yeah, no sh There seems to be some kernel of good intention in there somewhere. That kernel being the building of scientific knowledge. However, that's not all there is to science. One shouldn't think that building scientific knowledge is the end-all be-all at any cost. We live in a world with non-scientists, people interested in science, governments, laws, and more. You gotta try to work around and within all this, even if you don't like it. 
Even if building on scientific knowledge is seen as the most important goal of scientists, which it shouldn't be, scientists shouldn't be thinking only in terms of building scientific knowledge, since there are many other ways to do science and to apply it, even as a paleontologist. To build science, you also have to build scientific communities, to train and support the people in these communities, and to reach out to people who may be unaware of how they can have an impact on their lives and the lives of others by doing science. In other words, laws like those in Brazil, made to prioritize and help out Brazilians over foreigners, aren't there to say F you to foreigners, but are to attempt to foster a bigger scientific community in a country where the emphasis is usually placed on scientific breakthroughs that have immediate impact on communities. Though paleontology has more applications to everyday life and the future of our planet than you'd think, so it should get more emphasis than it currently does, but that's a topic for another time. I think it's funny that Martil got all anti-SJW over the Brazilian laws when laws that help those in the country of origin are common throughout the world. Many European countries and the US have plenty of research grants only available to citizens, making funding quite a challenge to those researchers working in these areas that happen to be foreigners themselves. That's also where the collaboration code comes in. One great way to bolster a scientific community is to involve members of that community in your research project when it involves specimens from their region. After the controversy of the four-legged snake, Martil would later go on to publish more fossil material from Brazil. Martil didn't learn anything, as the situation with a little peacock-feathered theropod would go on to show. 2020 saw the publication of a paper on the remains of a feathered theropod dinosaur from the same Crato formation of Brazil as the four-limbed snake. This specimen was also illegally taken out of Brazil for a separate German museum, Staatliches Museum für Naturkunde Stuttgart, back in 1995. It remained in the museum until further preparation was done on the specimen to reveal the bones and feather impressions. So, this one went against the two Brazilian rules as well. The paper on the specimen was temporarily removed a few days after it appeared online, and was permanently withdrawn in September of 2021. It's therefore now considered an informal genus. Prominent Brazilian paleontologists created the social media campaign Hashtag Ubirahara belongs to BR in order to drive attention to it and all the other colonial apprehensions of their fossils. So, back to our lizard skeleton. This early Cretaceous aged fossil preserved the entire skeleton with four small but well developed limbs, a very long snake like torso, shorter tail, broad belly scales, and a short-snouted skull. When all of its characteristics were tallied up and thrown in the computer to see where it should place in its tree of life and what its relatives are, it was placed in a group of other primitive snakes near the beginning of the Serpentes suborder. Tetrapodophis was most closely related to Coniophis, Najash, and Dinalesia. Tetrapodophis was seen not as a direct step in the tree from lizards to snakes, but it split off before the most recent common ancestor to all living snakes. This means it would give us a good idea of what that ancestor may have looked like, but wasn't that exact ancestor itself. That was until the brand new paper published in November of 2021. A team of scientists got a chance to reassess the remains of Tetrapodophis to see if the ancestral snake identification really held up to scrutiny. Our team included Michael Caldwell, Tiago Simoes, Alessandro Palsi, Fernando Garbaroglio, Robert Rice, Michael Lee, and Randall Nidham. They made sure to discuss the controversy of this specimen in detail. Many in the scientific community suggest that specimens like these are no longer science. When a specimen has been acquired by ill-gotten gains, in other words, unethical ways, the description and popularization of the specimen incentivizes more unethical acts to be taken to get more specimens in the same way. This is more important to the discussion of amber fossils as they are taken from mines in Myanmar, where the working conditions are extremely unethical. 
The result that many suggest is that specimens like Tetrapodophis should be erased from research programs. Our team thinks that past a certain point, a specimen can no longer be ignored scientifically, especially when they are as important to our understanding of evolution as Tetrapodophis is. Tetrapodophis was first noted as a four-legged snake in the popular journal Science, which led to references and recognition of the animal as a four-legged snake in literally tens of thousands of pop sci outlets, in print, in media, and more. So more harm would be done by ignoring the specimen than re-evaluating it and contesting its phylogenetic position. Make sure you've subscribed to see more natural history content like this. Hit the bell icon to keep yourself in the loop and leave a comment if you feel like it. The team was able to study the specimen and photograph the fossil with a digital microscope. This provides far more information on the bones than the original paper. They painstakingly redescribed every single bone in the skeleton to be able to compare it to the first descriptions made by Martil and his team. Turns out, a lot of the descriptions and characteristics described by Martil and team were not great, with many only stating characteristics and not exactly where those characteristics are on the skeleton. So, what did they come up with? Their analysis, including both observation and description of the morphology of the bones, plus the computer dataset for placing the critter in a phylogeny, found that the damn thing ain't no snake. It ain't just a lizard either. It's a dolichosaur. The dolichosaurs were a group of late Cretaceous aquatic lizards derived from monitor lizards and closely related to mosasaurs and snakes. They were all long-bodied with short tails, pointy snouts, and teeny legs. The largest was Dolichosaurus, which could reach a meter or 3.2 feet in length. This new identification of what Tetrapodophis is means a lot more changes are in store for what the critter was when alive. No longer is it a four-legged snake that would slither and not use its limbs. No longer would it be preying on small land vertebrates like lizards and amphibians. It wasn't a burrower either. So Tetrapodophis being a Dolichosaur is weird on a temporal level. All previously known Dolichosaurs are known from rocks that date between the Cenomanian to the Maastrichtian stages of the late Cretaceous, so about 100 to 66 million years ago. But Tetrapodophis is from the Aptian stage of the early Cretaceous, so 125 to 113 million years ago. That stretches the evolution of Mosasaurs back a good 10 to 15 million years. Another weird thing about Tetrapodophis is that it comes from rocks that represent a freshwater environment, but most Dolichosaurs come from saltwater environments. Another outlier, like Tetrapodophis, is Kaganias from the early Cretaceous of Japan. Kaganias was also found in freshwater deposits. If Kaganias is truly a Dolichosaur, then the shared similarities in environment and characteristics between them might indicate that mosasaurs first adapt to freshwater environments before moving into the sea. I said before that Tetrapodophis was preserved in freshwater deposits. That's sort of true. No one knows for 100% certainty where the fossil was found because it was illegally chipped out and exported without any proper notation that any paleontologist worth their salt would have provided. Dating techniques plus comparing and contrasting the rock itself to rocks known from the area gives a rough estimate that it comes from the Crotto Formation. So it's most likely to come from there, but there's some room for doubt. Assuming it comes from there, both the Crotto Formation and the rock that preserved Tetrapodophis is composed of a disgusting mouthful of rock descriptors. Technically, it's a thinly laminated, microbially deposited biomicritic limestone. All that means is the sediment that covered the body was ultra-fine and made out of the dead bodies of microscopic critters. It also means that the environment at the bottom of the water body was anoxic, or without oxygen. That means it was toxic to anything that strayed too close to the bottom. That's also what helped to preserve everything that died there to the level that it has. 
these bodies of water would also periodically become hypersaline, so super uber salty. Not many animals like it super uber salty, so it's likely that it preferred fresh water but died here during a period of ultra saltiness. Martil and team originally identified the jaws of Tetrapodophis as capable of bending and swallowing large food items, like a protoform of what snakes do today. They figured it was a connection between these early forms of proto-snakes and the true snakes. This would have been the start of the evolution of a thing called macrostomy, the physical ability to swallow enormous objects due to a wide mouth. And yes, I know how that sounds. Then the first team identified evidence in Tetrapodophis for coiling and constriction. They thought that the elongated spine may have allowed the critter to throw its body around prey items and squeeze them to death. Finally, they thought the anatomy of the feet and limbs may have helped Tetrapodophis to grasp prey items with its wee little leggies to help get a better grip while squeezing the life out of its food. All that is now thrown out with this new paper. Turns out, the jawbones weren't all that distinct from most other lizards. In fact, there are many legged and legless lizards alive today that can swallow enormous food items, and yet, they technically don't have the same adaptations of the snakes that have that macrostomy condition, meaning it's kinda arbitrary. The elongated spine and flattened body shape are now reinterpreted to help the critter swim. The toe and feet bones actually present a level of inflexibility that may have helped propel the critter. The limbs could have acted as rudders, or mini tiny propellers. So there you have it, Tetrapodophis, once thought to be a new transitional form between lizards and snakes, is now more likely to be some form of dolichosaur mosasauroid that nabbed fish and crustaceans as it swished its eel-like body around. The 3D models in this video were made by Kuzim, or Adam Midzuk, and the animations were made by Tyler Addison. Their socials will be included in the description and the comment section below. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks goes to my Elephant Tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, Chris Frampton, Biotaverse, Arda Bayer, and Christoph Hubbinger, as well as my Tyrannosaur patrons, Iron Bladesman, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, and Dana Manchester.